Hello, and welcome to the scientist.com webinar series, the three R's of animals and research. This is part two, reduction, and it's presented in collaboration with the NC3Rs and Hera Biolabs. My name is Megan Moy. I am the category director of in vivo services here at scientist.com, and I've been with the company since December of last year. I have a master's in biotechnology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I've been working at scientist.com to help support the in vivo categories, including toxicology, DMPK, and pharmacology, and advance animal welfare compliance. Scientist.com is a B2B marketplace, and we were founded in 2007. We currently have uh, headquarters in San Diego, but we have offices around the world, including Boston, Cambridge, UK, and Tokyo. We have about 70 full-time employees currently and over 3,000 global suppliers covering 4,000 or more research services in our network. Scientist.com is an online marketplace for R&D outsourcing. So that means we connect research organizations of any size with a global list of suppliers of custom R&D services. And you can see some of these services down at the bottom, but there are many more available. One of the things we do here is support research, and that means that we support animal welfare as well. So animal research is, our, is essential in pharmaceutical development, but it's our obligation to conduct research thoughtfully. And so we support efforts to replace animals, reduce their numbers, and refine procedures wherever possible. We also support animal welfare efforts through our supplier due diligence program, through animal welfare information gathering and compilation, and through educational programs such as this one. Our three hours webinar series is uh, continuing in two weeks with refinement featuring Sinclair Research. If you'd like to hear any of the previous webinars, please go ahead and register or request the recording from us. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sam Jackson. If you have any questions for Sam or any of the other speakers, please go ahead and post them in the Q&A session at the bottom of the screen. Sam is the program manager at the NC3Rs, and he examines the potential to replace, refine, or reduce animals used uh, to model disease, to measure efficacy, and to examine the safety of new drugs. So this includes application of new technologies and human tissue and cells to replace animal models, improve productivity to humans, and to benefit disease research and drug development. He's recently organized several workshops and surveys that explore how human tissue is used in cancer research and safety pharmacology and identify the barriers to increase use of the resource. So prior to joining the NC3Rs, Dr. Jackson worked for 10 years in research uh, doing postdoc posts in neurobiology in both academic and industry settings. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sam Jackson. Great, thank you very much, Megan. Um, so I am just going to introduce the topic of uh, to, for today. I'm going to tell you a very small amount about where I work at the NC3Rs, uh, a little bit about the 3Rs in general, and then give you some examples um, of reduction. So uh, just a little, little word about uh, where I work. The National Centre for the Replacement, Refinement and Reduction of Animals and Research is based in the UK. Um, following on from a government consultation in 2002, um, recommendations were to give greater priority to the development of non-animal methods and the three R's generally, um, and to set up a national UK centre for the three R's. So in 2004, we were established um, really to lead the UK's three R's agenda. Um, and since then, we've become a, a world leading authority in the area. We uh, really apply the three R's as a framework to support science and innovation um, and improve animal welfare through investing in people and practice through our grant funding programmes, uh, through driving commercialisation of three R's relevant technologies uh, through our open innovation scheme, Crack It!, um, and to do so, we work across the bioscience sector with academics um, and industry uh, companies involved in biomedical research who are using animals and alternative methods. We also work with a wide range of other stakeholder organizations um, outside of biosciences, including in the chemicals, agrochemicals and personal care product sectors. We receive around £10 million a year, um, which uh, we spend on our research funding schemes uh, to support open innovation platform and to carry out in-house activities around specific subject areas. Um, and we often use working group or data sharing approaches to achieve these aims. 
We are around 30 staff based in uh, the London central office and we have five regional posts around the UK as indicated on the map here. Um, and we also work very closely with uh, scientists in Europe and in the US as well. So just as a background to the three R's, um, as I mentioned, we at the NC3Rs think of the three R's as a framework uh, and within which to do biomedical sciences. Uh, today we're going to be talking about reduction. Um, uh, but the three R's really are important for multiple reasons. So first off, they, they pri provide an ethical framework within which we can critically assess animal use uh, for use in science. Um, three R's are enshrined in legislation. Um, so the Animal Scientific Procedures Act uh, in the UK and similar EU and US legislation uh, defines the three R's as, as one of the uh, ways that we can uh, should be thinking about using animals in research. There is great public support for the three R's. So in the UK, uh, an annual poll, Public Attitudes to Animal Research, indicates that the public support animal uh, use in research only when the principles of the three R's are adhered to. And finally, the three R's can be implemented to improve scientific practice um, and to build new businesses. Um, this is part of our, our role in the UK. So today we'll be talking about specifically about reduction. Uh, reduction is defined as methods which minimise the number of animals used per experiment. However, the NC3Rs, we think about this as being appropriately designed and analysed animal experiments that are robust and reproducible and truly add to the knowledge base. So I wanted to give, uh, give you some examples of reduction. Um, we're going to hear an excellent uh, case study later on, but just to give you uh, an idea of the breadth of what can be considered uh, reduction type technologies or approaches. So reduction refers to methods that minimize the number of animals used per experiment or study, uh, consistent with scientific aims. It's essential for reduction that studies with animals are appropriately designed and analyzed uh, to ensure robust and reproducible findings. Um, and the examples I have on the slide here are using improved statistics and experimental design. And I'll give you an example of our experimental design assistant in a second. Uh, reduction also includes methods which allow in, uh, the information gathered per animal in an experiment to be maximized. Uh, this is in order to reduce the, the use of additional animals. Examples of this include uh, using some imaging mod modalities which allow longitudinal measurements in the same animal to be taken, for example, rather than culling cohorts of animals at specific time points. Um, things such as microsampling of blood where small volumes uh, enable repeat sampling in the same animal. Uh, and reduction in these cases has to be balanced against any potential additional suffering that might be caused by their repeated use. And finally, falling into the reduction category are um, uh, uh, are ways of sharing data and resources, so uh, either uh, animals, uh, tissues or equipment between research groups and organisations, and this can uh, contribute to reduction. So some of the benefits of applying reduction um, to research uh, include the improving the accuracy and validity of the data collected from the animals. So a well-designed and executed study can ensure that animals are used in the most effective and efficient way possible. Um, this is more likely to result in a valid data set containing useful translational information uh, we can then take through to inform uh, the clinic. It can also increase the fidelity and granularity of the data collected from a single animal. So collecting more data from one animal can increase the power of a model and potentially reduce the um, number of animals that way. So for example, applying new technologies to longitudinal studies or increasing the sensitivity and specificity of an assay or a measurement technique. And these really do have the potential to save time and money um, as well as reducing animal numbers that are used in experiments. So I'd like to just give you two uh, quick examples of resources or tools really that we have um, uh, come up with at the NC3Rs which can uh, help with this area. So first off, I'd like to highlight the Experimental Design Assistant or the EDA. Um, and if you'd like to see this for yourself, the, uh, the web, um, uh, the URL is at the top of the page here. So the EDA was de uh, developed to improve the design of animal experiments. It's a web application um, with an extensive supporting website which helps researchers design their animal experiments better. Uh, the target audience really are early career researchers, so PhD students and earlier postdocs. Um, it it's, uh, enables users to get a greater understanding of experimental design and especially how it uh, might impact their particular experiment. And you, you build up a diagram of the ex uh, experiment on the screen and the system will, um, will feed back to you to improve the experimental design and suggest things like randomization, blinding, and help you with sample size calculations. 
Um, you can share these diagrams around as well. So this can improve transparency and help communication um, of experimental design. So the EDA was developed by a collaboration um, from a working group of in vivo researchers and statisticians, and it's been designed by a software company specializing in uh, artificial intelligence. The second resource um, I wanted to highlight were uh, the ARRIVE re research reporting guidelines. So uh, these were developed as part of an NC3R's initiative to improve the quality of reporting of biosciences uh, using uh, research using animals. It's essentially a che checklist of 20 items which are, are the key information which are necessary to describe a study comprehensively and transparently so that it can be repeated by somebody else. Um, it can be used to ensure the reproducibility of animal research and, and avoid, uh, avoid unnecessary animal use. Um, and the guidelines have been, been endorsed by a wide range of journals, some of which require a completed checklist um, on acceptance of a manuscript. So this is becoming uh, more embedded in the publishing process. So that's all I have to say for my introduction. I'll pass back to Megan. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And for the attendees, I'd like to remind you that if you have any questions for Sam, uh, please go ahead and submit them in the Q&A portion at the bottom of the screen. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Sutton Jamling from uh, Harrow Biolabs. Uh, Dr. Jamling is a molecular biologist and he specializes in custom rodent models. He's the VP of Research and Development at Harrow Biolabs and he's developed the SRG Onco Rat, which is a double knockout immunodeficient rat model for xenograft studies. And he'll be discussing some of this today. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Sutton Jamling. Thank you, Megan. And thank you, Dr. Jackson, for the overview. My name is Sutton. I'm the VP of Research and Development here at Harrow Biolabs. And uh, we are a young, uh, small CRO, started in 2015. Uh, so in the past uh, uh, four years, uh, we have developed a, a rat model for preclinical oncology studies. And today I would like to share with you how uh, use of that model you know, uh, can be applied uh, to the three R's principle. So without going in detail here, as Dr. Jackson already covered it, three R's basically uh, the replacement reduction and refinement of animal use and research, uh, which we all deal with. So it's a le legally required uh, principle. It's ethically important and it's scientifically important. And today here, focusing on the reduction part of it, I will give you examples uh, how we use the SRG on Coret uh, that allow us to minimize the number of animals used per experiment and also how we use it uh, to gather more information per animal uh, uh, in an experiment uh, that leads to overall reduction of animals. So the SRG on Corat, uh, as I said, is a RAG2 IL2 double knockout rat. Uh, it has an eight base pair deletion in the RAG2 exon, uh, which leads, uh, makes a BGDJ recombination uh, deficient, uh, leading to absence of B and T cells. And then uh, it also has a 16 base pair deletion in the IL-2 receptor gamma gene, uh, which uh, you know, leads to uh, ablation of the NK cells. And on the right side of the screen here are basically you know, the fact spots uh, for showing that these animals don't have any mature T cells, B cells, or NK cells. Um, circulating uh, in the system uh, and it's hard to find them even in their source organs, uh, thymus and uh, spleen. So this, uh, I will talk about two different utilities of the SRG Oncorat. The first one here, here being for xenografts and the example I'm showing here uh, focuses especially on xenografts for cell lines that are difficult to work with existing mouse models, right? Cell lines like VCAP, which is a uh, AR dependent prostate cancer line, which has poor engraftment efficiency in the NSG mouse or the skid, uh, not skid mouse uh, or other mouse models. And not only uh, poor engraftment efficiency, but highly variable uh, growth kinetics in the mouse models, leading to very poor enrollment rate uh, into the studies. So either enrollment rate is really low or the enrollment window is too wide, uh, compromising the the data, uh, fidelity of the data that you generate. So in the SRG Oncorat, we have consistently getting over 85% engraftment rate and uh, compared to a variable 20 to 60% engraftment rate uh, in the literature. In our own hands, we can get about 40%, but the growth kinetics uh, in the NSG mouse 
are so variable that our enrollment window is over a month, a 30-day period. So in the SRG Encored, we're getting 85% in graphing rate and over 90% of them can be enrolled within, within a seven to 10 day window uh, for, for studies. So on the right is showing the you know, discre discrepancy in the graphing rate uh, between the Encored and the, uh, and the mouse models and further uh, along the growth curve is being shown, you know, the studies we have done head to head, uh, tumors growing in the VCAP, VCAP cells growing in SRG versus in SG mice. And so we, uh, these engrafted, uh, engrafted uh, oncorats can be utilized for efficacy studies. Uh, as an example, on the bottom, it's just a standard of care treatment to enzalutamide in the green line uh, compared to the vehicle control on the red line. As you can see, those tumor growth uh, is really tight. Six animals uh, per arm is enough to generate really good data uh, in this animal. So in terms of the reduction, focus on reduction uh, of the animals used uh, for a study like this, for a tough uh, cell line that engrafts poorly in the mouse. So in the SRG on Corat, let's say, I put some numbers up here, just representative numbers. If you wanted to enroll 32 animals in a study, let's say eight animals per arm, four, four arms per study. So for the SRG on, on, on Corat, we would want about 34 to 38 animals that engraft and grow the tumor because uh, we have a really high enrollment rate, which means you know 85% engraftment rate, we inoculate about 42 animals. Whereas in the NSG mice, if you want to enroll the same number of animals, 32 animals, within a let's 14-day enrollment window, you would have to uh, get about 32 to 96 animals engrafted, just because the growth kinetics is so variable. And then with the low engraftment rate, we would have to inoculate about 160 animals. Uh, this is based on the internal uh, work that we have done, the growth kinetics shown on the right. Uh, there are some literature out there where people are getting a little bit better and that number might be a little bit lower, but uh, there are others that show, you know, that those numbers would be higher also anecdotally to the clients that we are talking about. So that, that is a uh, big reduction in the number of animals you start with here for, for, for an efficacy study. Beyond that, for xenograft studies like that, right, uh, not just running an efficacy study, but the second point of reduction where you gen try to generate as much data as possible from a single animal. So with the rat being a much bigger organism than the mouse, it has about 10 times the volume of blood that a mouse has. Uh, we can do a lot more from a single mouse. So we can do serial blood draws, for example, for PK analysis or for biomarker analysis, as we are showing here. So let's say theoretically we do, you know, uh, we want to look at the biomarkers here. So this is for VCAP study. We're looking for serum PSA level, which is... Uh, a biomarker for, for the cell line. And so you say, you know, eight animals, two animals from each arm, uh, you know, and looking at three size references as, as the tumor grow, grows. So for the SRG Encorat, these can be the animals that are enrolled in the study. We don't have to enroll any more studies because you can just pick the animals from the group and do serial blood draws as it goes. So the number total number of animals remain at 42, whereas for NSG mice now, this would be a terminal blood draw. Uh, for this assay and for many other, you know, clean path assays that you might be doing. So you have to uh, inoculate additional animals uh, when you start off. So just keeping, you know, keeping the numbers as small as possible, let's say eight animals, three references, that's 24 extra animals to what we started with, bringing the number up to 184 animals now where the Encorat remains at 42. And on the right, as you can see, we did uh, that exactly uh, blood draws from these animals at different tumor size volumes, uh, serially drawn, and then check the uh, correlate the PSA level to the tumor size. And you can see it's a very nice correlation of, of uh, our value of over uh, 0.9 there tight correlation indicating you know the tumor is uh, growing and it's uh, exactly what it's supposed to be. So that's one. Another way, another thing we have done with rat is we have done tumor biopsies or sample fine needle aspirates that you could do for uh, pharmacodynamic studies or molecular analysis, you know, target engagement type analyses that you can do. So the tumors in the rat, again, for this, uh, as you saw in the previous slide, where I was showing the NSG versus uh, SRG growth curve. 
the tumors grow so much bigger in these rats. These rats being physically bigger are able to support a much bigger tumor volume than the mouse, which allows us to do fine needle aspirates and the tumor's growth curves uh, remain unaffected uh, with doing fine needle aspirates. So again, let's say eight animals, three time points, we wanna look at it, SRG on correct. Again, the number stays put at 42. You can recruit the animals in the study uh, to do these fine needle aspirates without having additional animals. Uh, and for the NSG animals, again, you would have to add in at least 24 animals. So, you know, that number goes up, uh, which it could be more uh, uh, because engraftment and growth rate uh, difficulties, but at least you'd need to add 24 animals. So that's uh, on the right, I'm showing you a couple of things we have done with these tumors biopsies. Again, on the Western blot shown here is again for the VCAP cells. We are looking for uh, tumor biopsies and we are doing Western blot to look at uh, androgen receptor expression in these tumors at day one, day 21, day 28 of the dosing study. Uh, and also we are looking for PSA expression in these tumors. As, as you can see, the, everything looks good. Uh, these tumors are what we think they are. They're expressing the receptor uh, target of choice that we're looking at, and the biomarkers are also there. So, uh, and these animals are enrolled in the study we're looking for. Another type of thing uh, on the right here is for a non-small cell lung cancer we were looking at treated with uh, uh, Crisodinib, which is a MAC inhibitor, uh, right? So with a fine needle aspirate, we're able to look at uh, the PK, uh, the AKT to phosphorylated AKT ratio in the vehicle control versus uh, the treated uh, animals. So as the tumor size is decreasing, you can also see that the biomarker uh, are getting phosphorylated or not uh, over time. And these can be done at multiple time points. So again, uh, total of these for these three stuff, uh, um, as you can see, the animal numbers we use are down to about a quarter required in the rat uh, as uh, compared to the mouse. So uh, we're happy uh, that we're able to show uh, this utility of the Onco rat. Uh, and so this is one example. We have done similar studies for, for other uh, lines also. Uh, we'd be happy to share you know, if you have uh, more questions. Uh, so it's, it's a real good tool for uh, xenograph lines that are, are tough to work with in the mouse, but even if they work well, you can do these combination, get much data, more data from a single animal, uh, which might you know, uh, be beneficial uh, for your studies. And not just for animal numbers, but there's also something to be said about the quality and the power of the data that you generate, which uh, Dr. Jackson touched on a little bit, right? So for these kind of biomarker analysis, PK analysis, molecular characterizations, uh, these then, uh, when you use the Oncorat, you are generating these data serially from the same animal being monitored over time. And it's the same animal that you also uh, uh, measuring the response to for your uh, drug. So the data, I think, is much higher quality, whereas for an NSG mice now, for each individual time point, as you are already aware, you'll be using a separate animal, and which is, you know, different from the animal that's being treated with a drug. And so over time, these many different animals' data points are being strung together to put on a single line. And uh, so uh, your data quality gets much better when you're using the Encore. So the next, uh, the second point I want to touch in uh, uh, on for the utility of Encorat in this uh, focus is uh, for establishment of PDX and PDX expansion. So as I mentioned before, and as I show you on the graph down here, the tumor volume, the SRG rats, Encorats can support about 10 times the tumor volume uh, than a, a NSG mouse or, or any other mouse could. So as you can see here, these tumors grow can grow up to 30,000 millimeter cube, whereas in the mouse, they're at about two to 3,000 millimeter cube in volume. That's your humane endpoint. So which means in the PDX uh, focus, when we grow a tumor, a patient tumor on the, on the Oncorat, from a single animal that grows it, we can generate over 100 two by two millimeter tumor pieces that can, you know, uh, that go into individual atoms. So whereas to generate that in the mouse, uh, you would have to go through several passages to generate that much tumor. 
So that being the main point here. And then also, uh, as we show for VCAP, this data here on the right for the engraftment efficiency is for non-small cell lung cancer patient samples. So we, uh, uh, the SRG Oncorad, again, uh, is displaying much better engraftment rate uh, for patient samples, the non-small cell lung cancer patient samples. And we are trying some other ones, ovarian gynecological ones, the ones that are tougher to grow in the mouse. And so in the mouse, uh, you know, you get an engraftment rate of about 20 to 40 percent range. If you scan the literature with the SRG Oncorat, we are getting over 80 percent engraftment efficiency. So com combination of, you know, when you get the tissue from a patient, you get a limited number of tissue. You can maybe put them in two or three animals. So a combination of the engraftment uh, improvement versus how big these tumors can grow to establish a bank of, let's say, about a thousand tumor pieces. Uh, we are estimating about a 90% reduction in the animals used to establish and expand that PDX when you use Oncorat. And I'll show you some data on the right, histology data, original patient sample, the first passage uh, grown in Oncorat, and the second passage, uh, just showing histologically, you know, that tumor is what it's supposed to be and shows the markers that we are looking for. So, right, so we reducing the number of animals, but not only that, again, back to the data quality wise, when you apply these principles correctly, right, the, uh, there's good data showing that as you passage these, uh, tumors uh, in animals over successive passages, there's drift in the tumors uh, and they, you know, they get further and further away from the original patient material that you collected. So when you use Oncorat, we have, there's no need to passage any further than um, passage one or two, depending on how you number these. And so it's very low passage number and you can always go back to your bank, a very well established bank, and you would always be, you, you know, working with the passage one tumor for your studies. So uh, your data quality, again, is gonna be better and hopefully uh, translates to your, to the clinic better. So yeah, this is again, uh, right, expansion just graphically in showing you know, uh, how bigger the tumor grow, grows, how, uh, you know, the passage, elimination of the passages. And again, uh, not only uh, lower passage for quality, lower number of animals used, but for establishment expansion, the time, again, uh, is uh, highly reduced to establish a PDX bank. The tumors grow bigger. We don't have to go through successive passages. And also the tumors, uh, the growth rate is faster in the rat. Uh, than in the mouse. So with that, I will wrap up. Thank you so much and turn it back to you, Megan. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Jamling. Uh, as I mentioned before, please go ahead and continue to submit your questions at the bottom in the Q&A section. Uh, my first question that I've received is for Dr. Jackson. Uh, Sam, how can individual researchers ensure they aren't reproducing a previously completed study? Um, yeah, this is a really good question, and it's quite hard to do. I mean, I think my, my first answer would be um, do a literature search, which is pretty obvious, I guess. But as we all know, um, a lot of uh, especially negative studies aren't reported at all. Um, this is something that we've um, been talking to various people about as to how we can start to ensure that um, data from uh, that, that comes out negative in a study is actually um, out in the public domain so that another researcher can see that someone's already done that experiment and not repeat it. Um, it's it is it is a difficult one because unless it's been published you're unlikely to be able to find a lot of information on it um i think we are usually as scientists embedded in communities of people who um, work on similar things to us so certainly keeping an eye on what your colleagues are doing um to as much as you can uh, is a good idea too and sharing information but obviously um you know some of that is going to be proprietary so yeah i think that the, the key way to do that would probably be literature searching fantastic thank you uh, the next question is for Dr. Jamling. Um, how do you get the Oncorat for research? Can you buy them outright or does Hera do the studies for you? Oh, really good question. Thank you, Megan. So Hera uh, is a CRO, it's a small CRO. So we do services uh, in the Oncorat ourselves here uh, on site, uh, but we also do uh, commercially sell the SRG Oncorat. And it is, it's a timely question because uh, third quarter uh, this year is when we started uh, making the rats available from Charles River. So we uh, really derived a clean colony at Charles River, it's established there. So if you're interested in getting the animals, 
uh, please get in touch and the animals would ship from Charles River uh, to your facility. And of course, if you're interested in doing studies with us, uh, we have the animals here uh, ourselves and we offer a preclinical CRO uh, service in the animals. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Jackson. Um, how do you collaborate with other 3Rs groups um, in order to maximize your overall impact? Um, yes, so we, there are uh, in various countries, certainly in Europe and in the US, um, dedicated 3Rs centers that's, that work on various different aspects. In actual fact, um, while we collaborate as widely as we can with, with those other centers, um, the, it tends to be that they specialize in, in one thing or another. So um, a lot of the focus is on replacement technologies and developing technologies to, to uh, try to replace some of the animal studies. Um, essentially, I, I feel the other two R's are sometimes a little um, less uh, kind of dwelled on, if you like, and actually it's sometimes difficult to create a technology or something saleable that you can then attach to uh, reduction or um, refinement. But we have, I mean, we have lots of examples of those in our portfolio where researchers have been able to do that. Um, I think that there is great value in, for instance, um, the uh, US and, and Canadian societies which have, have been set up um, getting through to the grassroots of science in, in those areas. I think that these principles of the three R's are pretty well established um, all, all over the world, but seem to be uh, more ingrained in uh, scientific thinking in the EU um, than in North America at the moment. And, and that's uh, entirely my own opinion, but um, that's the impression I get. So yeah, collaborating with uh, the groups that have been set up around the world is, is a really important way to try and, and get the best practice um, into the into labs. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and the next question is for Dr. Jamling. Um, this person is wondering if you have immune system humanized rats for immune oncology studies. Huh, that's an excellent question. So yes, uh, it's an obvious uh, route to go uh, because of the uh, 10 times volume of the blood in the rat. And so we are working on it. We have some really exciting data on PBMC and BLT humanization in the rat. Uh, we're not quite there to offer services in the uh, humanized immune system rat yet, but we are getting close. Uh, it's an R&D project right now internally. Uh, uh, so we are getting engraftment of uh, PBMCs. Uh, we're getting engraftment through the BLT method. Uh, now we need to get it consistently, you know, the consistent engraftment and also getting the engraftment levels higher. So we are optimizing the procedures to, uh, to make it more consistent. It's, very, it's quite variable right now. We are getting engraftment, uh, but it's not quite ready to, uh, to be offered as a commercial service yet. But if you have interest in uh, a humanized immune system rat uh, and you know are interested in collaborating with us and furthering this R&D project uh, we would be very interested in hearing from you. Fantastic and um, for those uh, listening in you can also contact Hera Biolabs through our platform at scientist.com. Um, and then one final question for Dr. Jackson. Um, can you describe the Crackett program in a little bit more detail and explain who can participate? I'd be very happy to do that. So Crackit, um, I mentioned earlier, is um, our open innovation uh, scheme. So essentially what we try to do with Crackit is to take technologies that may have been developed, for instance, in an academic setting, um, and give them the push that they, they need to get to a point of commercialization where they can then either be sold on or a company can be set up to, to, to perform a service or, or, or give the product. Um, it's a, it's a competition-based uh, scheme and it's essentially a funding scheme, but it's very closely project managed by ourselves. And so usually there, there are two types of challenge, but the, the larger type of challenge um, is a two-phase uh, challenge whereby we invite applications to a problem which has been set um, by industry usually. So uh, to, to answer a specific unmet need um, in industry, um, they will set a challenge uh, with us. And we will put that challenge out to tender. Um, and so the people that apply for those are consortium based uh, groups, usually because the challenges are quite large. Um, those, those applications will come in. We usually choose three or four uh, of those applications. Um, actually, I should say that's done by an external panel, uh, which are then funded for a phase one, six month proof of concept study. 
um, and then those people come back in and sit in front of the panel again and uh, show what they've done over six months and usually one group is then funded uh, for three years uh, for around usually around a million pounds for those for those projects so um, these run once a year we launch um, we launch them usually uh, in the new year um, and a uh, consortium can then consortia can then apply for them or indeed um, contact us to ask us questions about the challenges so uh, those challenges are usually fixed to a fairly um, uh, thin uh, area and they, they will be specifically around developing a, a technology usually um, but as I said, these are consortium-based uh, problems, and so usually these these uh, challenges need uh, different expertise being brought together to be able to actually answer them properly, which is one one key facet of this. Um, the funding is currently available um, in the UK and the EU, but certainly US partners can be on those projects as well. Um, and all the details about this are available on the NC3R's website and actually Crack It um, has its own dedicated website, which we call our innovation platform. And so all of the projects, past and future and present indeed, are, um, are, are on there uh, for you to be able to look at. Fantastic, thank you, Sam. And that was the last question. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to submit them to us via email. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Jackson and Dr. Jamling for joining us today. And for all of, to all of you, uh, thank you for listening in. Have a wonderful rest of your day.